Welcome in to the Otson Audibles podcast. Matt Prem, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack, all three of us on the show today, a Tuesday afternoon here in Eugene. Uh, fall has officially arrived. It's like the first morning we were at practice and it was legitimately cold outside. Um, it's November, which means it, it's make or break time for your season. Um, I think Brandon Dorless spoke today at practice and said something along the lines of like every week's a playoff. If, if we slip up, we're done. We're not going to make the college football playoff. Um, Dan Lanning and opened his th- Monday night press conference uh, by saying, you know, they've got a really big month ahead and you don't really hear him kind of like look ahead all that often. And he said, yeah, this is, you know, this is a big month um, for Oregon as they currently sit seven and one overall uh, highest AP rank they've had this season at number six college football playoff rankings will come out in about three hours and six minutes after the start of this recording. Um, So we'll have some reaction to that later on in the week. Um, but Oregon, Oregon's going into November with a huge win in the books. And now they turn their attention to Cal and for the most part, they're pretty much healthy. Um, Eric, you can give the guys that we didn't see at practice. Doesn't mean that they're hurt though. Yeah. Let's, let's start there. Um, neither Steven Jones or Take Taimani were spotted my media at practice on Tuesday. As Matt said, guess what? Washington week, we didn't see Brandon Dorless on a Tuesday. He was back out there on Wednesday and, and has not missed a beat in terms of injury. So it's very possible this is a class conflict. Who knows? But I think we should at least acknowledge the fact that these guys aren't there. And these are two pretty important parts of the offense and defense, respectively. Stephen Jones, obviously, your starting right guard and Taki Taimani. Um, not necessarily a starter, but somebody who has played really, really well this year in the interior, um, especially on rundowns. So Two pretty notable players. I don't remember seeing either leave Saturday's game at all no. with injury. So my expectation is it's not that. But who knows? There's Football is a physical game. They could have gone down in a practice on Monday. Or they could have had a dental appointment. There's all sorts of reasons that they're not there. But we will have more updates on, on Wednesday or Thursday um, following those pra- uh, practice on Wednesday and then the Thursday show to hopefully give you a sense of where things are at with those two. But to Matt's general point, Team's really healthy, especially when you want to compare that to the team they just played last week. When you even want to compare it to the team they're playing this week, who's had several injuries, uh, most notably to their star running back, who I don't know if I've seen anything clarifying his status. I yeah, I haven't either. So Jaden Ott being that player, and we'll get more into Cal going forward, but I think you have to um, feel really good about Oregon's from a health perspective, considering we're, we're now about to enter November, and there's knock on wood, no Whittington is really the only – significant injury who a player we know won't be returning this year and even these guys we're mentioning are, are guys who i i don't think any of the three of us think it's like a long-term thing by any means we don't really know but it's worth noting um on tuesday that those guys weren't there yeah certainly worth noting um other guys uh kamari terrell some trainers not in cleats um kyrie jackson we didn't see jump into any drills during the mod bracket but uh he came and talked to the media afterwards so he probably played. I mean, again, like we only get to see 15 minutes and it's usually the not very competitive portion of practice. And it's the same as Eric just laid out. Like, I don't know, maybe he was feeling sick. I mean, Dan talked about on Mondays, like, well, you know, we we have a good sports science system here that lets us know um, when some guys like the load that they, they carry during a game is too much and how we can morph practice around their schedule to make sure that they feel better and they can get well rested. Like, that could just be the case today for all three of these or four of these guys that we've mentioned. So uh, definitely worth mentioning, but we'll know better literally tomorrow at this time, 1, 1 p.m. Pacific, uh, and we'll let you guys know. Oregon's attention, um, a lot of guys were asked by GoDucks.com writer Rob Mosley about just the focus has – yeah, the, the team always says they have a 24-hour rule. They're gonna they're gonna celebrate the win or they're gonna sulk in the loss, and then 24 hours later they they gotta move on. And a lot of guys were asked about that. Um shockingly, they're all moving past Utah. Big surprise. Um and and I say that sarcastically, but like I, I, you you generally believe that that those statements yeah. do. Like that's not a, it's not a surprise, but this is a team that just 
they feel different. They're locked and loaded. They're really dialed in on the task at hand. You, you, you ask a lot of guys, why is this, this player good? Or why is this position unit good? Or what led to, you know, being able to, to handle this pass rush, what have you. And more often than not, players, coaches always reference back the team connection, the team chemistry and the leadership on this team. Um, it's really good. And I, what you heard from some of the leaders on, on this defense is that they're excited for how they played against Utah, but they've flushed it and it's on to, it's on to California and a California team, as Dan called them on Monday, like kind of inverse of what they've historically been. Like they've always been known to be, I won't say elite, but really solid defensively. Um, they always give teams fits defensively historically, but this season their defense hasn't been the best. And offensively, in years past, it's been a challenge to move the football. And this year, not the case. They've made a change at quarterback. Um, Mendoza's a true freshman and has kind of flourished in the last three games. And they've used a tempo offense that's really pushed the metal to the you know, the pedal to the metal. And you know, I'm not gonna say they're they're this juggernaut offensively, but they are significantly better than what they historically have been the last three or four years under Wilcox. All seven years. This is the best offense Wilcox has had um, just going through the numbers like this. And, and to your point, Matt, that's, that's what you see when you watch them. And that's certainly what you see when you look at the numbers. Like I was looking through last, last night, the Cal's points per game under Justin Wilcox. And that kind of <laughs> sort of speaks to the offense they've had, but the best they've had ever was 27 points per game. And that was like three or four years ago. And last year it was just under 24 points per game. And, and, and now this year they're, they're scoring um, about 33 points per game. They are fifth in the Pac-12 in scoring offense. They just were uh, a two-point conversion against USC from pulling the upset, but also from scoring 50 points for the first time um, under Justin Wilcox in a conference game. They scored 50 points for the first time period uh, in the season opener against, uh, I think it was Texas State. They've is, never scored 50 before this year? Uh, under Wilcox. Holy mm -hmm. crap. I mean, they're I mean averaging, they, were they were averaging 27 <laughs> points per game. So um, yeah. this is a, this has not been a potent offense by any means. And this year they're they're showing a little more. And again, we'll, we'll get more into the weeds in terms of some of the players and, and what you need to know there. But I, I agree with Dan's kind of assessment there. When when you look at Cal, and obviously he's had less experience watching them like in totality. He's obviously very familiar with what the program has been, but this has only been his second year in this conference facing Cal. But even he's aware this is kind of bucking the trend from what you see from the Golden Bears. This has been to what Matt said earlier. Like usually you go into an Oregon Cal game going, can can Cal get to twenty eight points? Because if they do, they might hold Oregon beneath that number and have a shot. You know, then they've had a couple of games that's been really competitive. They've had a game, obviously, during the COVID season where they upset Oregon, kind of playing that manner of football. This year, they're more likely to put up forty eight points, not against Oregon, than they are to hold an, a, an opposing offense to twenty four points or something like that. So, um, yeah. I, I think you're going into this one thinking. Don't expect this to be a Cal team that holds Oregon under its season average significantly, but also don't expect this to be a Cal team that doesn't score the football similar to what we've seen in, against some of these opponents recently. Um, this is going to be a, another challenge for um, Oregon defensively. I totally expect that they'll be up to the task and that they'll do a really, really good job, but just a little bit of a different team heading into Otson this week than you're used to seeing when a, when a Wilcox-led program comes, comes calling. Yeah, it'll be weird. It'll be very similar to what Stanford is this year in terms of just like the overall strangeness. Not that they play very similar offenses, but the fact that like Cal or excuse me, Stanford like can slow it down, but at other times they can speed up the offense and try to go like no huddle, which is something the old Stanford never did under Harbaugh and Shaw. Um, yeah, but Fernando Mendoza, their third or well, fourth string quarterback going in the air. I think it was his third. Um, he was really good against against USC last week. Uh, they run a ton of RPO stuff. And when I mean a ton, I mean a ton of RPO stuff. So that's something certainly to watch. Um, talk to some defensive players about that today and just the, the the struggles, not so much from a secondary perspective, other than the fact that they, you know, they can't assume it's a run because shoot, there's a pass option, RPO, fun fact. 
Um, so they have to be, be on top of their game. They have to stay sound in their defensive schemes. But for uh, an interior lineman like Keon Ware Hudson, you know, it, he said it was difficult um, because exactly that. You, know, you have to stay keen on your guys and you have to stay grounded in order to see whether it's going to be a run or a pass. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Cal defense because like the emergence of their offense, there has been a vanishing act portrayed by their defenses. Um, the offense is uh, the credit is certainly due. They've gained uh, 3,380 total yards of offense this year. Uh, their defense has allowed 3,240. So they are allowing more points than they are scoring by just one point, 32.4 to I think 33.5. So not great. Um, here are their last five games in total offense allowed. Uh, 497, 445, 499, 439, 529. Not great um, at all. Uh, that 499 was to Oregon State and 445 to Utah. Um, Oregon obviously will play Oregon State later in the season, but they did quite well against Utah's offense, even though it was Bryson Barnes going against Cal. So like Eric was talking about, this could be certainly be a high-scoring game. I wouldn't expect uh, people to go into this thinking that Cal is going to you know, hold Oregon to under 35 points or something like that. Um, this is certainly a team that can that Oregon can run on. Uh, Utah ran for 317 yards against them. That's not bad. Um, Oregon State ran for 203. Even Southern California ran for 128, so that's not bad. So certainly a high-scoring potential in this game. We'll just have to see how... Uh, how Oregon's defense prepares because this is going to be tough with the RPOs. It's annoying. It's it's a difficult team to defend against. It's kind of like uh, Stanford was a while ago with their slow mesh points. It's just it's a little bit different, but it's still like that that kind of um, you have to figure out whether you're going to be against a run or a pass, and so it can be confusing to a defense. But uh, Oregon's defense has been pretty darn good this year. To provide a little more context to the defense, um, their best player got hurt two week, two and a half weeks ago, Jackson Sermon against mm -hmm. Oregon State. And yep, right. um, that doesn't excuse the fact that they gave up a lot of yards um, previously to, to Washington, 529, and the ASU's ASU, 439 or whatever. But you look at the rushing performances the last three weeks when he has gone down, and they've all been significantly really good. And – you know, two of those three teams are teams that run the football in Oregon State and Utah, and then the third one, to Jared's point, even or, you know USC. Uh, I don't know if you guys realize this or not, um, but USC actually has a really good run game. Marshawn Lloyd is actually like I think first. Of the I know he's really good. They just, they just don't yeah. give him the, the football. Um, so yeah. like it, it, plus that. Sorry to interrupt, Matt. Plus that that USC total against Cal includes like six or seven Caleb Williams sacks. So they really honestly ran the ball well against Cal. Yes. Um, just an add-on. Lloyd of the running backs in this conference, other than Bucky Irving, is is to me the most impressive in terms of open field ability to make players miss. There's a, there's a little bit of a similarity behind there. So I have I, I think that's a player in a week we're going to be talking about a lot right. because he's yeah. a good player. The, the point is, is I, I think Oregon's going to look at the – the last three weeks and go, wow, like we already knew their best player was hurt and they clearly can't reproduce anywhere close to the level of production without Jackson sermon. And it, it sucks. Cause that's a good player. He's a fifth year senior. His career is done. Um, it's the son of an Oregon legacy too. Um, but offensively, at least you, you expect Oregon to kind of target. I think that lack of run defense, um, offensively Dorless gave us the game plan like very similar to what it's going to be last week uh win on first down put them in second and longs and second third and longs and make them throw the football um mm -hmm. can they do that the rpo is going to be the big question you know can they do that i would say yes more often than not but they'll probably give up some plays Jaden Knott's phenomenal and, and we all, and again, we don't know his status, and that's a big one. And, and and unfortunately, Byron Cardwell, who would probably have been the second running back in that rotation, is out for the season. Oregon fans know him well. Obviously, he I think he tore his ACL in camp. Um, that's a really tough break for him. To basically two lost seasons in a row after a very encouraging true freshman year a couple of years ago. Um, the tempo is another one I wanted to bring up. We talked about the RPO mm -hmm. nature and kind of the stresses that puts on a defense. Um, 
they are, and Dan said it, and I fact-checked them. By one play, they've ran the most plays of any Pac-12 offense this year. They do try to go fast. Um, they're, I think, 13th nationally in plays run. And again, running a lot of plays doesn't necessarily speak to being a high-tempo offense because you can run how much you can run your plays really fast and they don't go anywhere and you don't run a lot of plays, right? So like that doesn't necessarily right. speak entirely to tempo, but the fact that they are, they lead the conference in plays run is sort of notable, especially considering this is an offense that historically has not just been very good. Um, Personnel-wise, we've already talked a little about Ott. I think – I don't know if we said it on this show, but he was a one-time Oregon verbal commitment, same high school as Travis Dye and Troy Dye. Um, this is a guy who ran for like 275 yards and three touchdowns a year ago against Arizona. I still remember we were up at um, up in Pullman after Oregon pulled that incredible comeback against the Cougars and heard like the radio or, or something, the, the, the stat line. It was like, oh, my gosh, like he's just going off. And this guy has, has continued to be a really productive running back. He's leading the conference in – uh, yards per game he's missed one game but he's averaged over 100 yards per game this year so if he does play this is again two consecutive weeks we can talk about arguably the best running backs that Oregon have faced this season I think if yeah. Ott does play I would say he's the best to this point Jackson's a totally different player but um, Ott's really versatile he's got he leads the conference and runs over 60 yards he's got a couple of those he's also pretty well put together at six foot 200 so he's good between the tackles pretty versatile player um, Jeremiah Hunter is their lead receiver. You might remember him from last year. He had about 100 yards against Oregon. And, and again, that was pretty one-sided. Um, but he's he remains, uh, leads the team in receiving. Jared did a little rundown on Mendoza. Defensively, uh, Xavier Carlton, and I think it's, is it is it Malachi Dupree? I might have the name wrong of the other edge player. Jared might be able to help me or Matt. Oh, the edge player? The other edge, yeah. Who's if you pull up Pia, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out in a second here. But uh, th they've got two pretty decent edge players, is the point I was going to make. Carlton's is their best graded uh, PFF player on defense, and he's an edge player. Yeah. And then the second is whatever the name is, who I might have just completely butchered. So apologies. I'm still early in my. Are you count. talking about Caleb Elam's El or? He's the well, there's not a Malachi. Right? There's not a Malachi at all. I'm not seeing one. Who, who, who's the who's the second best PFF graded player after after Carlton? Whoever that is is who I was talking mm -hmm. about. Oh, um, okay. Caleb Elarms uh, or is their leading tackle. He's actually second in the Pac-12 in tackles with 72. He's had some monster games. I think he had 16. He's tackles. quite good. I like um, I like watching him a lot. And he's a, he's out of nowhere. This guy was didn't even have a tackle all of last year. Um, Xavier Carlton and Miles Jernigan. Miles Jernigan. What did I say? Malachi Durant or something like that? You know, Some M first small, name. Uh, shooting guard Malachi Durant is. Yeah, that, that, that was – my brain's probably mixed up sports. Uh, either way, th they've got players, at least according to PFF, that are decent off the edge. So just a couple of players – I thought personnel players to, to acknowledge um, in this one. Other than that, I don't think there's a ton from a personnel perspective. Like this is not a team that you look at and go like this is – one where you expect there to be an awful lot of all Pac-12 selections from it. Um, I think Ott has a chance to be certainly among those. Um, receiver room in this conference are so strong that even though I think Jeremiah Hunter is a really good player, I don't expect he'll be on there. And then yeah. I, I wouldn't anticipate any of these defensive guys being too high on that list, maybe just because of the production. Um, Elarms or will will sneak in there. But it's it's a Cal team defensively where you're – I was going through it doing my know the foe five players to know and without sermon available there's just not a lot of like household names or guys that you really recognize mm -hmm. when you're going through through the roster um raymond woody's kid is still with the team by the way which is crazy that was a guy i remember watching he was a high school teammate of uh of patrick herbert at sheldon when when his dad was was coaching with for willie taggart at oregon for that one year but uh he doesn't really play so um that was, <laughs> that was i think he's hurt I, I yeah i don't think he, well yeah he's been at Cal for two years and has played like six or eight games. So he's even if he's available, I don't know if he's a contributor. So I really like Elarm Zor. I think he's a great linebacker. I know like PFF doesn't really say it, but he's long, he's athletic, he can run downhill. Um, I've actually watched a decent amount of Cal football this year and like kind of like the game recaps of like hour long stuff. Um, their defense, they just don't have the big playability. Um, teams can like I've like I kind of talked about without Sermon and his tackling ability and able to read gaps on rushing downs, it just kind of get bowled over, unfortunately, for them. 
Um, but they do send a lot of pressure uh, against USC. That was their main thing. They like to send their linebackers in pressure. Um, and that's how they got to USC a lot. They got to Caleb Williams. They forced him out of the pocket with some linebacker pressure. Um, not so much simulated like how Dan does and how Georgia has done where they line up like six guys to one side and two to the other and then four drop back and three come from the other. All, all that good stuff. It's more so just straight line drive blitzes from their, from their linebacker core. And they're certainly going to bring pressure on Knicks. Uh, you're going to want Oregon's offensive line to hold up on that, uh, which I thought that they did a good job against Utah and holding them to, I think it was just one tackle for loss all game. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just not with the Cal defense that we have been accustomed to. Uh, the cornerbacks are fine. Nothing crazy. Nothing uh, how it has been in years past where – They'll have like an all-conference defensive back. They've had multiple all-conference safeties in their in the past couple of years. Um, that isn't this team. And this kind of feels like how it was going into Washington State. Like these two teams can score. And it's just gonna be like, all right, who can who could force a turnover or two? Who can stop them on third or fourth down and short and force punts uh, early on in the game. Like, I, I just think there's just too much firepower here for, for Cal against Oregon. I'll be curious to see how Mendoza holds up on the yeah. road in this environment. Um, mm -hmm. He played undoubtedly his best game. And again, he's a second year college player. He's a red shirt freshman. He does not have very many snaps to his mm -hmm. name. Played really well against USC. That was at home, right? Now they have to go to Otson. The week before that, I guess they were playing at Utah. He didn't fare too well in that one. So no, um, no, no, no. I, I, I think this is one where, unlike you kind of talked about, like the potential for high scoring offenses, Cam Ward made some just unbelievable plays that allowed Washington State to move the football and have success. I am skeptical. He's Mendoza. not Cam Ward. <laughs> yeah, I'm skeptical no. Mendoza can no. do those kind of things. So, like, if you're Cal, no. I think you're hoping, and, of course, Cal has a much better secondary punch, or actually it's probably the primary punch, which is the run game with Ott, who, again, is right. going to be a challenge. Like, your hope is that the inverse happens to what Dorless was saying, where that you are able to pick up six to eight yards on first, create some chunk plays, and then mm -hmm. face second and third that are manageable for your young quarterback. Because if the opposite is true, what just happened to Utah is probably what's going to happen this weekend where you force Bryson Barnes to try to have to beat you on third and long. And I don't expect right. Mendoza would fare any better. It might fare even worse just because of the lack of experience. This game might go pretty quick because to your point, like they might try to run the football on first and second down to give themselves either a, a first down or B some kind of third and manageable because if, I, I I just think this is by far the best defense they're going to play. I know Utah's statistically is really good, but they're so yeah. banged up that this is going to be a big step up from where Utah is compared to what Oregon is healthy. Um, Utah healthy, probably similar, but yeah. they're not. Um, if, if, if this game could go quick though, because I think they're going to lean on the run and just hope mm -hmm. they don't make mistakes and hope they can get Oregon to make a mistake or two. Um, I'm not going to predict a Mace Funa interception a la Washington State, but we could see a lot of batted balls. We could see an opportunity if Oregon's DBs or linebackers scout this well and recognize it, jump in some short passes. I don't think they're going to throw the ball deep. Like, I just don't, I don't think they, that leans into what they want to do. And it's going to be about similar to Washington State, batting balls down quick, maybe jumping up some quick routes and getting them into third and longs situations. Yeah. And, and Mendoza, to, Dan was very complimentary, but when is he not? And to his credit, you want to be, you don't want to like disparage your opponent that never, like karma doesn't help. That doesn't help with karma. And it also just doesn't really benefit you because you're giving the other team bulletin board material for no reason. But he did speak about how Mendoza is somebody who delivers bullet passes. He can fit the ball into tight windows. Um, yeah. You see a little of that. I think his receivers really help. Like, I really do like Jeremiah Hunter quite a bit as a receiver. Like he's always been the last couple of years, at least one of my favorite guys in this conference in terms of just like making contested catches, making the tough catches in traffic and big, athletic, strong, 6'2, 200. Um, poses some issues. But yeah, to the point we we're making before, like this really does feel like unless 
Mendoza and Hunter connect. And they have a couple other big receivers on the outside. Um, if, unless those guys are just out there making incredible plays, like kind of outside of their their pay grade or above their head almost, like it's just going to be hard for Cal to, to keep pace. And again, I don't expect Cal's defense to slow Oregon's offense. If Oregon's offense is playing the way it's been playing really all season, aside from a couple of slow starts there in the middle of the year. Yeah. Yeah, Mendoza, to Matt's point, just doesn't take a lot of shots downfield. Um, BFF says it's at 16% of his overall total, his shots 20-plus yards down the field. He's fared decently well, um, maybe. I don't know, 21% completion, but they've all gone for like a bunch of yards. So right. uh, hit or miss, which is like a lot of deep shots. But you know, it's only four, he's only completing 43% of his passes, over, like medium 10 to 19 yards. Um, this is certainly an opportunity if Oregon feels like they have the dogs to do it. No pun intended, as Matt's dog just walked in. <laughs> nice. But um, if they feel like they have the dogs to go and just play man coverage, which they have done all season long, um, they can just let guys eat on the inside and just kind of send them home free and then force uh, force a decision to be made in that RPO offense and make it a difficult one at that. Um, this could be like, I, I agree with Matt where it's like, this could just be a quick game because I think Oregon's going to try to exploit the run game and Cal is going to have to establish that to start the game, to make it any semblance of a game where they can try to keep it close because with, if they don't get Jay not going, which they didn't do last year against Oregon's defense, um, it could, it could be a long day at the office. And if you're Oregon and you just shut down Utah's running attack, I know Jaquin and uh, Jackson, Johnson. I don't know why I can't remember that. Um, I know that he was kind of banged up in the beginning, but um, still, they, they completely shut down Utah's rushing attack, which I think is better than, than Cal's. Ott had, I think, 57 yards from scrimmage last week, and that included a couple of catches. So you're right. Last year, they were able to take him out, and I think that's sort of the feeling here. And again, if he's not able to play in this game, I – don't know their personnel enough to know their second string running back, but I know Byron Cardinal well, would, have, would have been. It's, so it's pretty good. It's Isaiah FNC, and he's in the top 10 in the conference in rushing. Well, he also got hurt last week. Oh, did he? Yeah, Cal was down to their fourth string running back at the end of the game. So they have they've got some injury issues to deal with on their uh on their offensive side of the ball, but there is not a lot of uh reporting going around yes. on Cal football. So yeah. uh, no news Very, on Mr. Ott or or the other guys. But you know, they they went through a lot of running backs last week and not on purpose. I think they played five of them. So maybe it's even down to the fifth stringer. Well, we'll look into more of that. Uh, we'll also have uh, Brandon Huffman on the show later this week. Um, we'll also be doing our game picks as well and our predictions later on this week for the show. But that's going to do it for us today on the Austin Audible's podcast. Until the next one. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.